You are listening to History Man, a podcast for curators, historians, and authors to tell their stories at the American Revolution, where we walk in the footsteps of heroes and proclaim freedom reigns. History Man is excited and glad to present today a retired Lieutenant Colonel of the U.S. Air Force, Richard Allen Morris, who is the Vice President of the Piedmont Region, Sons of the American Revolution, and a volunteer at 96 Historic Site in Greenwood County, South Carolina. Welcome, Richard. I appreciate you being here. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you. Richard, in preparation for this uh, episode, we were talking about the importance of 96 not only in the history of South Carolina, but also in the history of this country. And we were talking about the, uh, um, the tie-ins that 96 had that, that, in many ways, a lot of people, or most people, don't know about. Uh, it's a gem of a historic site, and uh, you are the man to tell us all about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the man. There's, there's probably a lot of other people that have more information than I do, but I've been doing this for volunteering for about five years now, and... Uh, I've, I've gathered a lot of information from the park rangers at the park and also from my own uh, research, so uh, I, I appreciate you coming. Well, the, uh, the, the infrastructure at 96 is fairly interesting. You still have uh, a lot of the fortifications there. Some of them have been rebuilt, but you can still see the Star Fort out there. You can still see parts of some of the old roads that were out there. Uh, there is a... Uh, you can kind of see the there's a trench that runs from the from the actual fort to the town of 96, I think, uh, which was a kind of a shallow ditch that supposedly was was used for various purposes. But uh, if, if you don't mind, let's start off by kind of giving our listeners a geographical overview of 96, where it lines up in the whole scheme of uh, South Carolina, the East Coast, and then. Uh, you know, when it was first founded, and then we'll just go from there. We'll take as many episodes as we need to. Okay. 96 is an interesting place that uh, was established basically at the boundary of the Indian Territory, at the northern boundary of the Indian Territory. Wh- which Indians? Cherokees. Cherokees. Cherokees by, uh, by the uh, late 1600s uh, were the only tribe in this area. Okay. The Cherokee controlled basically the other northern part of South Carolina, and their interests ran all the way to the coast. Okay. So basically, those those are the Indians down south. Of course, you had the Seminoles up north. You had the Catawba. They kind of use uh, North Carolina, Georgia, the rivers, right. kind of divide the Indian tribes as well. But the Cherokee occupied the northern part. Now, the big thing about the Cherokee was that they didn't have any villages south. They were all in the foothills, up around Clemson, where Clemson's located at right now was the was the closest village to Charleston. I see. And so. The Indians used all this land for hunting ground. Is that right? This was their hunting ground. They also planted crops here. They cleared some trees and, and were planted crops, and they come down and harvest them at the different various times of the year. Uh, deer, uh, bison, herds, herds of them. As late as when? Well, uh, they started uh, harvesting these animals, of course, whenever the white man showed up. I see. And uh, I can give you some statistics. Uh, regular trade was first established with the Cherokee by the white men. Uh, DeSoto had made a trip up through here and had actually didn't stay, of course. He was looking for the gold. Right. <laughs> had turned around and left, but he had originally came. He was part of the reason that the Indians down south didn't survive because of the diseases he brought from Europe. Right. When you read uh, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, he talks about that. He talks about... Uh, how civilizations prospered and moved forward in many respects because of guns, germs, germs, and steel. And he cited those early explorations by the Europeans into the North American continent. And uh, though they did not have open warfare, the germ warfare uh, took care of mass populations. Mass populations. And the southern Indian tribes who had uh, participated in the war earlier in the 1700s all dis- pretty much all disappeared because of that. And so the Cherokee had kind of, believe it or not, the Cherokee hadn't joined them in that war, uh, the Yamasee War. They hadn't joined them. The Cherokee refused to join the other Indian tribes that were trying to drive the white man back into the ocean. Okay. And when those Indians died off, guess who took their land? Uh, uh, I see. The Cherokee. That's right. 
So a little, a little undercurrent here, a little uh, thing going on. But in 1690, by 1690, they'd established regular trade routes with the Indians coming up from Charleston. And what they were looking for a lot of times uh, were deer hides. Okay. Especially. It had become very popular in Europe. One of the things that the park rangers had told me was that they actually had like a mad cow disease that occurred about the same time around the 1700s in Europe, and they killed off a lot of their cattle. So leather was a problem. Is that right? Leather was a problem. Now, I can give you a, a couple of examples. In, in 1700, uh, Charleston was the primary port for South Carolina for shipping the deer hides. Now, also Savannah in Georgia and up in uh, North Carolina, uh, Richmond in, in Virginia. So all along the East Coast, the Indians were bringing these deer hides and exchanging them. At, uh, they exchanged, uh, around the 1700s, they were exchanging, bringing in a, approximately 100,000 deer skin a year. 100,000 deer skin they were bringing through, Char that's just through Charleston. That it doesn't include the other, other towns that are on the coast. That's what they were shipping out of Charleston. In uh, 1748, they shipped 160,000 deer skins out of Charleston. Out of, just out of Charleston. Just deer skins. Just deer skins. Wow. It doesn't count all the other hides. I, I, there there may be records, but beaver pelt. Beaver pelt doesn't count the uh, muskrat, doesn't count uh, the bison right. that they were killing. It didn't count any of that. Um, at that time, 400,000 British pounds is what that 100,000 deer skins. So you can imagine the white man, guys who are entrepreneurs, as we called them, would want part of that action. And so they started showing up in the country of the north, northern part of South Carolina and hunting the deer. And now you can see with the conflict that's being set up between the white man and the Indian because the Indian felt that they were encroaching right. encroaching upon their, their territory. Now, 96, how did 96 come about? Uh, we'll, say, okay. we'll say this. Okay, we, we just talked about the Cherokee kind of backfield where the other Native Americans were, but their idea of land ownership was contrary to the European idea of land ownership. Yeah, and they didn't recognize lines. Right, right. <laughs> you know, Europeans were all like, okay, I'm going to draw a line here, and you can't cross that line. Well, they're looking at him like, you've lost your mind. Right. You know, right. it's out in the middle of nowhere. Right. So the cultural, cultural dynamics there played so much into that as well. To so. contribute to the conflict. Right. Because, uh, you know, when the white man said, we're going to draw a line here and nobody will come across, this is your land, this is all your land. And then when the white guy crossed it, of course, they're going, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. You told us that, you know, nobody was going to cross this right. line. Now these guys are coming across the line. Right. But you guys aren't doing anything about it. I mean, they filed grievances. They, right. you know, they right. come in and right. do that. And they go, try to go through the white man's system. But the white man wouldn't support them. They just kind of went, eh, yeah, 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 okay, okay. It's so. tough, tough for them. Tough, tough form from a paradigm shift of, uh, in so many different proportions. Oh, anyway, absolutely. Go ahead. I'm so, sorry. So, 96, a lot of people, a lot of stories about how 96 got its name. 96 uh, miles from the closest Indian village, which is up around uh, where Clemson's at right now. Um, well, you, had a, you had a village, and there's a town even today called Six Miles, South correct. Carolina. Yeah. Right? So, it, it, it all kind of makes sense. But of course, everybody goes, well, it's really not 96 miles. Well, you're talking 1700s. There's no GPSs or satellites. Right. <laughs> these, right. these guys are kind of guessing. But what they'd done is they'd actually established a, a treaty with the Indians, and so they'd drawn a line, which is right now, if you go to the historical site, it's about a mile and a half, two miles south. That's where the line was originally drawn. South of 96? South of the original 96. Okay. How many 96s were there? There were four 96s. Uh, eventually... Uh, before 1800s was when the last 96 ended. Okay. All so, right. and we'll talk a little bit as we get through here. The uh, the gentleman who put 96 on the map, and I know that's a pun, he was a cartographer who the governor had hired to map this area. He wanted to know where all the Cherokee trails went, what they connected to, and so he wanted a map. So he hired a guy by the name of George Hunter in 1730. Do those maps still exist? I haven't seen one of those maps. All right. Now, on that map, when Hunter came north, of course, where did he stop? Well, he stopped at the rest stop that everybody else stopped at, going back and forth to the Indian villages. And he turned to one of the gentlemen that was sitting there, you know, cooking dinner, and he said, what do you call this place? And the guy said, 96. And that's what he wrote on his map. He wrote 96 on his map. And so, when he turned his map into the governor, that spot was identified as being 96. Now, uh, a couple years later, in 1737, the Indian agent, a guy by the name of John Lacey, 
was passing through on his way to talk to the Cherokee. He was their Indian agent uh, appointed by the British, and he stopped at that same rest stop, and he bought supplies. Now, what did he buy? He bought three gallons of rum and three pounds of sugar. How do you know this? It was recorded because he had to file an expense account to get reimbursed. Get out of here. And so when he filed the expense account, what it said on it was purchased three gallons of rum and three pounds of sugar at 96. And that's the way he got reimbursed. And they have a record of that from the British government. 1734. 1737. 37. 1737. Now, in 1749, Governor John Glenn, the Indians were complaining about the encroachments from the, from the white man coming into their territory. Now, remember, they, owning land was foreign to them. You know, they, they just used it. They basically were using the land. But John Glenn met with the Cherokee at 96, at that location, basically to try to keep the Indians from going to war. So John Glenn, in 1749, met with the Cherokee at 96, and they decided that they needed a treaty. Now, was 96 fortified at that point? No, there was nothing there. It was still the rest stop. Okay. When there you say no rest stop, I'm thinking along the lines of uh, the the, uh, the stagecoach lines oh, okay. through South Carolina where you have a two-story inn. I got you. And there's a traveler's rest, <laughs> actually, in, no. in Tallulah or, or no, no, no. the Tallulah River. What, <laughs> what does it look like? Water. Okay. Clear pasture for feeding the, the animals that you that you have with you. Ample game. That's it. You put up your own tent. Okay. All right. Here <laughs> it's we more go. like a campground. Gotcha. I, sh- I, gotcha. I shouldn't say rest stop. Campground. There. That's <laughs> probably a little more descriptive gotcha. of what they had in 1749. But Governor Glenn came came met the Indians. He uh, that treaty. If you go to the town of Saluda, painted on the wall of one of the towns uh, on Main Street, is that treaty being signed by General Glenn with the Indians? Now, what the in- Indians didn't re- understand, I don't think. General or governor. Governor, I'm sorry, Governor Glenn. Okay. What I think the Indians did not understand was the fact that he also was drawing lines on a map, and he was assuring them that the white man wouldn't cross those lines. This is as far north as they're going to come, and that line was was in between where the historic site is now and that that uh, campground. That's where that line ran. So the campground was kind of at the northern edge of the territory that the white man supposedly was allowed to settle okay. and hunt and participate in the property. Now, that was in 1749. In 1750, 1760, they had some gentlemen, 1750, they had some gentlemen from Pennsylvania show up and said, we got too many settlers up in Pennsylvania. They're still coming ashore in, in Philadelphia. We need to send them south. So if you know about the great wagon road that had gone from Philadelphia to the Allegheny Mountains, that wagon road, took a left turn when it hit the Allegheny Mountains and came south because these brothers that showed up in South Carolina said, we've got settlers. And South Carolina was saying, we need settlers. And so what happened was they kind of came up with an agreement with the governor that if these people showed up, they would be given land. And so that was kind of the carrot that was held out to these people coming ashore. We got land down south. Don't stop here, keep going south. The Great Wagon Road was extended down through Charlotte ended up down through Camden. Uh, a branch went off to 96, a branch went to Augusta. And so these people started coming in between 1750 and 1760, most of them from Pennsylvania. But they were all fo- most of them were all foreign settlers. There were a few people that had lived up in those areas that were coming south just because they got in trouble or whatever reason. 1751, uh, there was a, a line established called Hamilton Survey Line. And you can look it up on the map. It shows it. It's basically that northern boundary. And the reason they did that was because there was an entrepreneur in England whose accountant said, you need to buy up land in South Carolina and sell it to people. And his name was Hamilton, and that's exactly what he did. He got the king because all the land belongs to the king. So how did he do that? Is this after the king took back the land from the Lord Proprietor? No. This is all new land. This is all after new the, land? After the treaty. After the treaty. Okay. All so, right. so now they're saying, okay, this land's available. And so this guy by the name of Hamilton actually bought land, bought the land in England, never saw it, never had anybody seen it, but he sent a surveyor to draw a line. And if you look on, on the map of the, of the uh, 96 historic site, they'll sh- they show where that line actually ran across the property where uh, the historic site now sits. Did it go into North Carolina? Did it go into no, Georgia? No, it didn't go that far. Just stayed in South Carolina? Just South Carolina. 
so it's strictly done for South Carolina. So I, I'm assuming it stopped at the Savannah River, and I, I don't think it went all the way to North Carolina. It was just this area, basically. Okay. All right. Now, what happened after that was a guy by the name of Robert Gowdy. Robert Gowdy was a trader. He'd been running back and forth between Charlestown and the Indian villages, trading for the deer skins. And, uh, of course, what he brought with him were, were a lot of different things, uh, beads, uh, blankets, guns. A lot of people don't understand they were actually trading the Indians uh, with guns and things, mm -hmm. basically trade goods. Right. And the Cherokee women are the ones that liked it because of the different colors. Uh, well, you gotta you got to make the women happy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't make the women happy, you're not happy. Nobody's happy. That's right. <laughs> That's right. If mom's not happy, nobody's happy. So Robert Gowdy established the Gowdy Trading Post at the campground known as 96. Now, when he fa finally passed away, he actually owned 1,500 acres of land. He had 34 slaves. He had 500 people that owed him money because a lot of the things he did on credit. People right. just didn't have hard cash up here. He basically traded in deer skins. Now, an interesting story, I'll throw this out, is merchandise, when the Indians would come in, of course, they didn't have money to do the trading. So his merchandise was listed, this is two bucks, two male deer. You have two male deer, you get that to merchandise. Is, now, that, is that where that came from? Did now, that term come from? That's what I read. Now, whether that's true or not, who knows? I can't find, you know, document historical documentation, but I've, I read that. The other thing was, if you don't have two bucks, do you have any dough? And usually, two dough made one buck. This is a barter system on steroids. Barter but, system. But we, we have terms that may have originated from that barter from system. From that barter system around 96. Correct. Isn't that interesting? I th I've, it just blew me away. I read that, and they said, yeah, they said everything was listed as bucks and does. How many bucks, how many does? Well, interesting. Well, where do we go from there? Well, after uh, Robert Gowdy established his, his trading post, the Cherokee Corps were very excited about it, but the white man kept encroaching because it was money. There was money in deerskin, so a lot of hunters and people would cross the line, supposedly that had been established by the governor, the Hamilton line, and would hunt in the, in the Indian territory. And the Indians got mad. Not only did they hunt, but they also stole. At one point, uh, there was some Cherokee coming to Gowdy's trading post, had 331 deerskin that they were going to trade for goods, and somebody robbed them, held them up, took their deerskins. Well, the Cherokee, of course, complained to the government, but the government really didn't do anything. You know, kind of gave them lip service, but, eh, you know, there's not much we can do. You guys are up in the back country. We don't, really don't have anybody up there to enforce the laws. So what the government did do, though, was they created two militia groups for the upstate. Those two militia groups were basically to enforce the laws and uh, to keep things kind of under control, uh, arrest people. Uh, but everybody had to go to Charlestown. If you got arrested, they'd ship you to Charlestown for, for jail. How long a trip was that? Ooh. Most of the guys, uh, some could make it if they were just riding their own horse and they weren't pack animal or anything else. They said they could make it in about three to four days. Now, most of the guys averaged between seven and nine days. And, uh, it's a long trip to get some sort of recompense for. Oh, absolutely. Just a slight, but even a robbery. I mean, then you go down there and you make your complaint, but then they have to make the trip all the way back up here and then try to find those guys. You know. Exactly right. That's exactly right. And so uh, the Indians complain, of course, and, and part of the uh, process, uh, they were also trying to enlist the Indians to help them to keep the French out. The French kept showing up from the New Orleans area, promising the Indians that, you know, if they help them control the British, that all these good things are going to happen. And uh, so to keep the Cherokee kind of on the side of the British, they, uh, the British volunteered to build a fort. Okay. And then, so they built the fort right across from the closest Indian village, which was up at Kiwi, and they called the fort Fort Prince George. It was built in 1753 was when the fort was built. Uh, of course, things didn't work out, and by 1768, the fort had been abandoned. But initially, the fort was there, and it was there to provide the Indians with some type of protection if other Indians raided them or uh, anything was going on. 1754, of course, the French and Indian War started. Guess which side the Cherokee sided on? French and the British. They sided, they sided on both sides, depending upon which group you were associated with. And... Unfortunately, 
the British had lumped the Cherokee all into one tribe. Well, they weren't. Right. They were pretty much independent groups throughout, not only on this side of the mountains, but on the other side of the mountains and in the valleys of Tennessee, what is currently Tennessee. Right. The, the Cherokee, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but they had three distinct territories. They had the lower towns, the middle towns, and the upper towns, right? Absolutely. And each one was, was, was different. Self-governing. That's right. Own, own officials, own leaders. Uh, did they get along? No. <laughs> right. So... So you had the so if you had the the Cherokee Braves coming from the over the mountain or, or the upper villages, crossing into the you know over the middle village and over the lower village and stealing horses, well the locals thought it was the Cherokee from the lower towns and they're the ones who got got blamed for everything, right? Absolutely, and and even the Catawba that came in, the uh, Seminoles that came in, uh, unfortunately, like today. An Indian's an Indian, right. and they didn't make the differentiation between the different tribes, really, most of the people up in the upcountry. Right. And so uh, the Cherokee took a lot of blame for stuff that happened that they didn't, the Cherokee that lived on this side of the lower Cherokee took a lot of blame for stuff that they didn't even do. Right, right. Just by association, just by association. Now, 1755, they signed a treaty at the old Saluda town with Governor Glenn. That was following... Uh, uh, because the Indians had participated somewhat with the French, they made, made them sign another treaty, and they moved the line. So now the line, instead of being at Gowdy's trading post, now moves north, and it ends up at the, at the, uh, the Abbeville-Anderson, I'm sorry, Abbeville-Anderson County line, about where it's at now, that's where the line moved to. So now all that territory has now been opened up for settlement by the white man. That's right. Because the Indians didn't read the fine print. I hate to say that, but that's the way they the Brit- that's the way the British <laughs> operated, and uh, you know they'd write write up these treaties and they say, well, yeah, but you signed it, and mm-hmm. uh, and enforce it later. They really didn't understand, I don't believe. Plus, the Indians they said, well, we don't own the land anyway, so it's kind of like, oh, okay. So in 1755 they signed a, a treaty at Old Saluda Town. In 1759, Governor Littleton shows up at 96, and he says, you know, he says the Indians are getting a little rowdy, and unlike Governor Glenn. Governor Littleton's approach towards the Indians was not peace. Cohabitat, Littleton wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth. Take it by force. Okay. Eliminate the Indians. Eliminate the problem. And so he could see that a war was coming. So let me just, Littleton, the Littleton name is a big name in South Carolina. Uh, where was Littleton from? Do we know? He was from Great Britain. This was a, the governors were all appointed right. by the king, parliament, whatever. And uh, Littleton actually had come from England. So this is not someone from South Carolina who's having to live with the Indians and trade with the Indians. This is actually someone from Great Britain coming in and making a command decision that affects this region for years to come. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one thing a lot of people don't understand. They think that there were a lot of British troops in South Carolina. There were no British troops in South Carolina. None. The only British guy that was in South Carolina was the governor. Now, would British troops come in once in a while? Yeah, and we'll see that. They, they would come in once in a while, but they basically armed the people that were settling the property. The British did, and they created their own militia for their own defense. Mm-hmm. The British did not provide a, a huge army to sit and fight the Indians all the time. And so right. basically, uh, the only guy that was here was the governor who was from Great Britain. That's how the militia system came came about. Correct. These communities would would uh, would mandate that every able-bodied person from the age of 15 or 16 on up to 55, which 55 was a very old person at that time, <laughs> you know, but they would mandate that they come out and muster on had the, muster, to. the local muster grounds. They had to. There was no choice. There, there was no choice. And yeah. uh, so that's how they, they operated in the back, back country. In fact, the South Carolina State Guard, even to this day, traces back their history back to that original militia system in Charleston. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. that's the way the British operated. Whatever country they went to, it wasn't just our country. Right. India, all the other places the British had occupied, they followed the same playbook, so to speak. Right. And so this was nothing new for them. They'd already done this at other places. Now, the Indians finally go on the warpath. 1760, the Cherokee have had enough. 
the encroachments, uh, stealing their stuff. They've, they've just had enough. The unfair practices by traders, um, giving them fault, bad goods, guns that don't work. I mean, it just goes on and on. When you read the list, it just goes on and on. So in 1760, the Indians uh, declare basically war. When you say you read the list, did they did they give a list of the of the uh, the problems they had with the colonists? They did. They the submitted that in a cerebral way to the leaders in Charleston. To, to the governor. To the governor. Because he's the one who signed the treaty. So they presented in a democratic way their problems and the reasons they're going to war. And of course they were ignored. And when they were ignored, uh, there's always a few hotheads in the crowd, you know, that says, well, they're not paying any attention to us. We need to do something else. Mm -hmm. And so basically they went to war. The first attacks uh, they'd established the fort at 96. Governor Littleton could see that could see that coming. So what he did was he confiscated Gowdy's barn. Confiscated Gowdy's barn, put a stockade around the barn, and then put supplies inside the barn, gunpowder, lead, and that kind of stuff that they would need to basically fight off an Indian attack. Now, when Gowdy saw that the Indians were coming, which uh, didn't take very long, February, uh, Gowdy's trading post was attacked. Gowdy, uh, when the Indians were coming, didn't want to give the Indians a place to uh, shoot at them from, so he basically burned all of his outbuildings, including his own house, oh. so that the Indians wouldn't have any protection, and he moved into this fort, which consisted of his barn and a wooden stockade around the, okay. around the barn. All right. Now, is that the fortifications that you see out at 96 now? It is not. Okay. All right. Those were built. Those were built about a mile, mile and a half south. Okay. Of where the uh, park is right now, where the park uh, buildings are. But we generally know where that, where those buildings are now. Correct. And there's a trail that runs from, at the park. You follow the Charlestown Road, of course, because that was the road that they used for trade back then. You follow that Charlestown Road out of out of the park, going south, and it is part of the park. And they have marked off where they think Galley's trading post was. It's marked off with uh, uh, ropes and stakes. His son is buried there, and there's a, a fence around his grave, and uh, they've annotated that. There's also a cemetery that they found has about 40 stones in it. They think that was a slave cemetery. Okay. There's no markers or anything else. They're not sure who's buried there or anything else. But uh, uh, they, it's all part of the park, and mm -hmm. you can walk it. They call it the Gowdy Trail. It, it kind of peels off of the trail uh, as you're walking around the, the battlefields, mm -hmm. and it goes down to Gowdy's place. Now, that happened in February. There was about 40 braves. lasted about two hours. Uh, nobody actually got killed. I mean, the Indians were not successful. Uh, in, uh, in March, 250 braves showed up for 36 hours. They t took pot shots and arrows and everything else at the fort. But still, the Indians got the worst end of the deal. But what the Indians did do, two miles around Gowdy, everybody that had a log cabin burned. Outbuildings burned. Stock either taken or killed. People killed and scalped. They were still outside the fort. It was take no prisoners. The thing that happened, though, in the fort, and this is interesting, we talked about the Indians in the early days because of the disease and things like that. Fourteen people died from smallpox. Inside the fort? Wow. Inside the fort during the Indian attacks. Wow. The, reason they, the reason they got smallpox up here was because the fort was manned by troops from down south, militia troops. The governor had sent them north to help man that fort at 96, and they brought smallpox with them. These people had not been exposed. A lot of these people had come from other areas and had never been exposed to smallpox. So they, they, in the in the effort to help them fend off the Indians, they actually killed them. Killed 14 of them. 14 of them through smallpox. Through smallpox. Wow. Through smallpox. Now, in April, British regulars showed up. Now, this is going to play decisively whenever the Revolutionary War starts. British regulars show up. At 96, 1,500 British reg regulars under General Montgomery. He leads 50 troops at 96 at the fort that they had established there. This and this is 1760. This is 1760, yes, yeah, 1760. And he heads across the mountain. He's on a, on a rampage. Okay. He's killing Indians, burning villages, destroying crops, and he gets to the other side of the mountain where the Indians have laid a trap for him. He's not used to fighting Indians in the mountains. He's basically defeated. 
but he's still able to bring the rest of his troops that survived back to 96. Back to 96. And when he gets back to 96, he says, we're going to call this off. Winter's coming. We'll be back next year. Meanwhile, the governor sends a guy by the name of Moultrie, Major Moultrie, and his militia guys up to 96 to build a real fortification, not just a, a stockade fence around the barn. So they enlarge the, the fortification, and Major Moultrie, who doesn't like the governor, names the fort Fort Middleton after a South Carolina gentleman. Rice planter. Not after the governor, yeah. which the governor was not very happy about. Right, right was not very happy about. So when you read accounts, the governor calls it one thing, and the militia call it something else, and then the local people call it Fort 96. <laughs> it's all the same place. Right. <laughs> it's all the same place. But he brought with him about 220 troops. In May, the British show up again, led by a guy by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Grant, with his troops, the second campaign. He'd been with the, uh, on the first campaign, and he'd learned about the Indians. He'd gone home, you know, and so he knew that don't go into a trap. So he leads these guys, plus the militia people that he's pulled together, the local people, mm -hmm. and they go and chase the Indians over the mountains until in 1762, it was the end of the Cherokee War. The Cherokee said, we've had enough. And they actually signed a treaty uh, and the anderson Abbeville County line, like I said, had been established as that's now the new boundary, mm -hmm. new boundary. A flood of immigrants now come in because peace. The Indian threat's been, been done away with. All these people that have been, kind of been holding off because of the trouble, now they start coming into this territory, and uh, it grows pretty fast. 